So today we're going to be speaking with Tom Mead from FP Dublin, James Ruport from Portland, Oregon, and Lou Ellery from Brisbane, Australia. All these guys have been doing FP for quite some time, and they're all physiotherapists uh, in their own accord. So uh, Ireland, US, and Australia. Bringing them on today to kind of touch into some of the first how they got into physical therapy and their experience with that then what led them to eventually seeking out FP. And then after that, some of the differences they've found with uh, functional patterns and their practice, some limitations. And then after that, we're going to go into some studies um, that people in either in physical therapy or just that people that um, claim that studies are the best or that there are good studies out there that, that people can use to help their clients. We're going to go into them a little bit and, and Kind of give our perspectives on what we see and uh, maybe why we use certain aspects of it or why we don't use uh, some of those aspects. So uh, let's start off, guys, with just a quick intro. Um, yeah, just kind of uh, who you guys are, where you guys are from, and how long you've been doing FP. I'm a physiotherapist, or I was a physiotherapist, I'll say I'll put it that way. Um, I'm from Dublin and I'm working in functional patterns, Dublin with Paul Gallagher. So I got into functional patterns. I guess about five years ago. James Report, physical therapist out of uh, Portland, Oregon suburbs. I've been a physical therapist since 2015. I got into physical therapy myself as a kid, dislocating my shoulders all over the place. Very poor scapular mechanics. I think it was actually core and pelvis related really when it comes down to it and uh, just how my structure was insecure. Um, and then I started doing functional patterns in 2017. And it's mostly because of results at that point. Most of my pains were mostly well taken care of. I just started seeing results that I could not provide um, as a physical therapist. So that took me down the rabbit hole. I'm Lewis Ellery uh, from FP Brisbane. Um, I graduated in 2012 uh, with physiotherapy in Brisbane. I wanted to go into something that kind of had a mix between science and sport. I was kind of good at both those things going through school. Um, and in general, I wanted to help people close to me um, in terms of movement and pain. Uh, I moved into FP around a similar time to James, around 2016, 2017. I was pretty broken myself from playing a lot of sport and doing a lot of traditional rehab, and I tried a lot of other systems. Um, and FP kind of dragged me down the rabbit hole of looking at myself in a in a different manner in terms of biomechanics. So a little bit more to uh, go a little deeper into why FP. James, you mentioned some of the results. What was it specifically that you guys or kind of what situation you guys found yourself that um, made you kind of make the shift before we I go guess. into your, your experience? I can jump in there, Rodney. Um, when I finished university or college, I qualified as a physio. It was around the same time as Lewis, I think, so it was about 10 years ago. Um, we were taught in college all of the best research practices, guided you know, therapy, and all the, the treatments that we were providing were based on those sort of best guidelines and everything like that. I just realized after maybe a year or so, or even maybe less following those protocols that there was a lot of unanswered questions with clients that I was having where I couldn't figure out issues they were having. I couldn't figure out how to get them out of pain. It worked for some clients, I would say, but it's not, we wasn't really happy with, with that. You know, you want to try and help everyone that you can. And um, at that point, I probably wasn't in much trouble myself biomechanically, but in the year or two that followed, I started to go downhill very quickly. So I'm a strength conditioning specialist as well, or I was a strength and conditioning specialist, like a CSCS. So I was using those sort of protocols and research-based strength and conditioning for sports. I was playing a lot of Gaelic, like GAA, Irish football, and soccer, stuff like that. And then I started getting injured myself. So I would have had classified myself of, as having like chronic shoulder pain, like I would have had it for six months or a year. And it got really bad. I was trying to do all the traditional stuff, ways of strengthening the rotator cuff, all these things. I started getting some groin, adductor discomfort and back pain. So it was that point I was almost ready to stop doing physiotherapy as a job because I was I was feeling like I couldn't really justify giving clients exercises that I knew weren't working for myself. So I was at a crossroads. I was really lucky then, count myself very lucky that I found a functional patterns video or two of now de explaining some things. And I remember immediately just thinking, well, this is like there's a lot more to this, you know, this guy's going a lot deeper. There's he's, you know, account for a lot more variables. He's given away a little bit of information. He's not given away all the secret sauce in the videos, 
but even the bits that he was giving away, I could read between the lines and I knew that there was a lot more to this. And then like James said as well, the results, you start to see the results popping up and I started to assess my own posture, my own mechanics and saw how off base it was and how bad it was. Um, and that's what sparked the interest then. I remember buying the power posture one day. I think I went from the day before in the gym doing deadlifts, read the power posture and even just the intro of the power posture about the, the biological movements, walking around throwing. That was literally enough to have me never lift the weight again in that way. Like it was so powerful. Those few paragraphs were that powerful that I was literally like, well, what an idiot. Like I felt like an idiot at the time. I was like, hey, this is like makes so much sense. Why the hell have I been destroying myself with this other stuff? And no wonder I can't figure out my own pain problems and and also for my clients. So that was the the spark then that, that set everything into motion. Lou and James, kind of a similar story? Yeah, really similar, actually. I, I have a big history in cricket and I saw a lot of cricket players as well. Um, and very similar to Tom there, like I was able to help a lot of people in pain, but there's always, always this subset of population that seemed to just be really difficult to get anywhere with, with traditional research, with traditional protocols. So as well as doing it on myself, I'd start to look down other avenues and tried a few other methods, but nothing really would help that subset of people. Um, and at the same time I was struggling. So same thing as Tom again, um, it was hard to justify giving these exercises and protocols to people when they weren't working on myself. Um, and I thought I was a pretty good physio at the time too, in the, in the context of following research. So I kind of came across FP from there and that really changed my mind on how we should be training and treating people. You guys were kind of already practicing and, and trying to implement it, not for six months, not for a year, for, for quite a few years. So now kind of go into a little bit of your, your experience, uh, maybe more so James, I know you did some, some research. Um, I don't know if it was during your, your schooling or, or after, can you guys go into a little bit more of now your background, um, uh, more, more along in terms of the people that you saw, um, how many sessions in, in general you guys were seeing them, what kind of results, what happened with the people that you weren't able to get, um, result with did you just refer them to someone else did they end up seeing one two three four whatever many physios and then whatever happened to 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 them so if you can start tom and i guess like lewis was saying there was always that subset of question marks but i guess the way the whole physiotherapy and industry is set up it's the responsibility is almost not put onto the therapist to figure out the problem. If it's something that seems like it can't be managed, then it's just referred on to a consultant or God, like, unfortunately that could be a surgery down the line, you know? So some of these people, they might get referred to a consultant, then they might have, you know, injections or cortisone injections. They might have some sort of measures like that put in place to try and manage it. And then if they don't work, maybe they get a surgery. So I've seen this remarkably in the physio industry it's almost like the responsibility sometimes is, is put onto the patient, not onto the actual therapist to try and figure out the problems or take responsibility for figuring the problem out. So it's, it's wild. Like a lot of the, the clients don't even really blame the therapists that don't deliver and give them the right solution. So it's sort of almost like manipulated somehow. Where what, was they the, still think the what, was the, what was the longest time that you saw a client for? <clears throat> I would say I had clients that were coming for why well, six months or a year or even regular oh, really? clients that came for longer than that. But then really what it became was it was like a management tool. That was simply it, you know? So if someone ended up in a bad way, they might come in for a week, two weeks, three weeks. We do some hands-on like, you know, myofascial release. We do some basic stuff and then they might get like, we'll say 70 or 80% there. And then they might disappear for a while until they had another flare up and then they'd come back you'd manage that flare up. So that could go on for years, like really, but without real change, you know? And at that point, we're not really measuring biomechanics and that stuff with the same lens that we were, we are now with the same sort of scrutiny. So yeah, that was really the way that it went. But like I said, the irony of all that is you'll have people come in and go, oh, I had this great physio. Like I have this really great physio I've been going to for 10 years. Like I have clients that come and say that now. I'm like, oh, well, they're, they're great. You're still going 10 years later. Like you're still having all the problems. And they're like, yeah, but when I, when I have a problem, I go and then they sort of patch me up and they're great at doing that. Like they patch me up so well. And then off I go for another six months and then back I go again, you know? And then because the nature of biomechanical issues is that things get kicked from one part of the body to the other. 
it's almost like the perfect crime. Like you'll have someone come in and go, oh, I had a knee pain and have a great physio that sorted out my knee pain. And a year later, my hip is gone, you know, or something like that. And they don't even right. realize that the things are connected. So the client sort of can end up in that loop happily enough. It's not like, like Lou said, I would consider myself a good physio in terms of what was out at the time and what was being done and, you know, the research that I was following. Um, but I guess like that's the clients don't even make that connection. So they come back happily. It's not like they're arriving at your door going, oh, hey, why is this not better? You know, it's like that's how low the standard we've set for physio, I feel, is that I don't even think people really expect to totally transform and change and really get a, a real result or a solution for their issue. I really don't think they go to physio even expecting that. I think it's just almost like a, a management thing. And that's where their, their head is at, you know. So as I said, they could come in and they've had one small patch up paper off the crack and then have another injury a year later that we would know now is connected to the same biomechanical issue. But it's just another symptom of the same biomechanical issue. And as I said, they don't even realize it. So I think that's how almost subpar therapists can make a living really well and get away with it because the onus is not really on them to really solve the problem. And, you know? and what was the setting that you were working out of? Was it a clinic? Was it a I trained uh, in a in hospital. A hospital. I trained in a hospital, probably like Lewis and James as well. I would have had to do so many hours or clinical hours, like a thousand hours or something like that. And even here, the public medical system is, you know, very outdated and you would be sort of, your creativity would be stifled, let's say, you know, I had experiences with seniors or senior physiotherapists in the hospital where I might present an idea and say, could we do this for this patient? And I've been told numerous times, oh, it's not the protocol. So we don't really do that. And I'm saying, well, does it make sense? You know, whether it's protocol or not, is there any sense to it? I'm trying to learn. I'm a student. And they would just say, no, it's, it's not really what we do. This is just the way we do it. Or this surgeon likes that we do things this way. So I did some work in the hospitals. Enough work to let me know that I never wanted to be in a hospital. That was for sure. So when I came out then, I started doing a lot of studying into strength conditioning. And I opened up a small sort of um, practice, I guess, in a community center where there was a gym attached to it. So I would have worked in the gym as a trainer, as a strength conditioning coach, and I would have had a treatment room in the gym that I was using at the same time. So that was how it built up. But like the other two guys as well, it's like 10 years plus worth of experience of building it up. And then three years ago, myself and Paul Gallagher, my colleague here, we were both doing that individually. And we decided that we'd come together and try and open a functional patterns facility um, for both of ourselves to get, to get more serious with it and, and give the clients a better service as well. Got it. And then uh, how about you, James? Were you in a hospital setting as well? Uh, I did a little bit of hospital setting. It was actually all outpatient based on a hospital system. Um, and something that um, really sticks with me during that time is that we would take data. So when people came in for an evaluation, we would get a functional outcome scores, that ask them subjective questions. How well do you do with your daily activities? How well do you do with this, that? 10 questions, whatever it is. And it would be a rating like 50%. They're at 50% disability. And then we would have, our goal was to get them um, as high as we can on that questionnaire in as short amount of time as we can. So, okay, I got 25% increase in five visits. Once I discharge, that's the end of that case. And that data point is, is safe forever, right? So even though three months later, they come in for the ankle issue now, okay, let me make this ankle pain better, uh, 25% in five visits. Oh, I got 30% four visits. I did even better. And then their back pain episode, we start that off. And then we look at the back pain episode. So we break down each one of their episodes as a data point. And we were incentivized to get them out as soon as we can and try to have the most points per visit recovery as we could. Um, so it just kind of feeds into just some of the some of the problems with the holistic person like care that we try to do with functional patterns where like at functional patterns like you tell me you're in pain and I get it I understand this but I'm looking at your mechanics I'm trying to get you to be a better mover a better mover better health a better person I'm just trying to help you be a more functional person um, and odds are your pain is going to get better as we as we work on that um, so we kind of look at it from two different things uh, like two different lenses. Um, yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought, but I think that was a, you know, kind of my experience work, with the outpatient. What was the work with the research that, that you were mentioning before? Oh, um, you know, in this, 
I'm, I'm mildly skeptical of all biomechanical research. And you guys will understand this because we look at so many different, so many different variables with functional patterns. And we look at the qualitative and quantit try to put a quantitative aspect to it. How much motion here versus how much motion here. Um, but being part of uh, a research group to get my doctorate, I had to put together a year long research proposal. We looked at firefighters who were going through their kind of like basic training, um, Mesa fire department in Arizona. Um, and we looked at like thoracic mobility, thoracic extension, rotation, um, joint accessory mobilities, uh, hip flexor mobility, modified Thomas test, uh, manual muscle testing, a few different things. Um, and I, I forget some of the other things we we're looking at, but we we're trying to associate that with, with pain. So more or less, what are these biomechanical indicators and how are they um, correlated to pain and injury during the, uh, the two or three week firefighter training camp? Um, and we didn't come up with much. It, more or less, I think thoracic extension was the main one that is, if that one was jacked up, it had more incidence of injury, um, but it wasn't even that significant. And granted, you know, it was a doctoral paper. It, it was what it was. It wasn't that great. We weren't very great uh, <laughs> um, in that in that realm. You know, it's just not what I got into physical therapy for was to, to push research papers. Um, but it did kind of just highlight how mm, simplified, you know, it's just like an isolated variable. Here's an isolated variable. Here's an isolated variable. And it didn't come up with any real, real answers. And I'm not that surprised. Um, so that's always kind of Back then, did you think anything of it? Were you were you a little? Did you have like the I was a little on? surprised. You know, it's like, oh, I, I could have swore we would have found, you know, some meaning in in these restrictions that we found in their in their biomechanics, and I didn't really didn't really find find anything. I was a little bit surprised. Look, in hindsight, looking back at it, it's like, oh, it's because it's way too reductionist, uh, reductionistic. It just isn't that surprising. Nice. Um, yeah. Okay. And then now, so let's get a little bit more into the, the transition to RFP. You guys have all, you know, gone through the, the physical therapy um, curriculums and, and have had experience there. So generally you have more of uh, people, people kind of trust you more in a sense, or they, they're going to be bound to base if they, if they value that. So do you guys find that, um, basically the, the, the degree is a qualifier, like do people search you out for that? Or are you finding that people maybe see the results that you're able to put forth and the case studies that you guys are able to put forth with, with people and, and, and come to you for that? And, and does it change? Maybe if someone comes and um, seeks you out because, oh, you're the physical therapist, so I'd rather work with you. Um, and then as they train, do they change their mindset or, or is it, is it pretty, um, do they, I guess, prove themselves right to, to an extent? Yeah. As, um, as time goes on and the results get better, there tends to be less of a focus on the degree, but, um, in Brisbane where I work at the center, we have five practitioners currently, um, myself, I'm a physio and then two of our other human biomechanics specialists come from a history of trade backgrounds. So one being a roofer and one being a tiler. Um, they're also qualified PTs since they transitioned to FP2, just for an insurance kind of point of view. Um, and then the other two practitioners come from a nutrition and a PT background. So when people initially call, there's definitely a tendency to want the degree. They go, oh, you're a physiotherapist. Can I book in with you? And Lou, to clarify, they, when you say PT, you mean personal trainer. Sorry. Yeah. Personal trainer. Sorry, guys. Yeah. So myself coming from a physio background and then the others coming from personal training and then trade backgrounds and nutrition. Sorry, I should have clarified that. Um, so yeah, once they've come and seen us for any period of time, a lot of them do realize the pointless um, wanting for that degree at the start. Um, the other interesting thing I notice is with clients that come in in chronic pain, you'll often get them saying, I've seen six to seven physios. I've seen five or six chiropractors, osteopaths, whatever it might be but then they still say, I want to see you because you're a physio. And it's an interesting frame of mind 
like even when you just explain that to them, sometimes you'll get that light bulb click and they go, oh, right, yeah, that hasn't really helped me in the past at all, but it's just seen as the thing to know. And for sure, I think that there's definitely been a learning curve for the other guys at the start, mainly from like a customer service point of view and just learning how to talk to people. And this is where we'll probably go into the biopsychosocial model next, but learning how to talk to people and kind of extract information and find the best way of figuring out what's happened to them and the best way forward. Um, but I mean, even if you look at FP Brisbane's Instagram, like myself coming from a physio background, the other boys coming from a roofing and tiling background, um, over the three years we've been open, there's been periods where, especially recently, Max has gotten some crazy results. Throughout the middle of the time, Shane was getting a ton of results. And when we first opened, I was the one getting the results. So there's really no difference in the quality of outcomes I see from having a degree. Did it help me at the start? For sure. But overall, yeah, overall, we're looking at a completely different set of variables than we were when I was going through university and um, the private practices I was working in. Yeah, and there's definitely a, a, a time to, to learn the skills, right? Where when you're hiring an FP practitioner, you're not getting what they learn at the course, you're learning what they've been able to apply and test and, and figure out with a bunch of different clients. So it's, it's a lot of it is experience. Um, and that's, that's something that it doesn't seem like you get much. I mean, you get a lot, you get to see a lot more people, right. As a physiotherapist, but again, if it doesn't work, then they just, they, they get referred to someone else. Or like James was saying, you're just trying to get them, get to that number, get them to not feel the knee pain or not feel the ankle pain as fast as possible. And then, and then that's it. So when that doesn't work, you don't really get a chance to, to, to learn why and to relate like in a more holistic way to, to treat the, the whole, the whole system. Um, so yeah, that kind of brings us into the, the whole biopsychosocial model. Uh, James, can you, did you learn that in school? What, what was your experience with, with learning that and have you, found yourself using it what what's it been like yeah it was brought up to us in school um there's a couple different courses that i think i remember where they where they brought it up and we discussed um even just different cultural things um uh traditions whatnot but just more or less how pain affects all three of these circles bio psychological issues social issues and how those circles kind of can feed into each other um so it's been taught to me from the get go and I definitely appreciated having that taught to me. So I wasn't just like, Oh, let me just do this little joint mobilization and really try to just solve all of your problems. Like, yeah, we are working with people. We're working with people with problems. We have to understand them and connect with them and communicate to them clearly. And so the fact that someone told me that you have to do that early on probably has helped me go through a little bit of a learning period. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's something that I use. It's something I use, uh, I've used before I used functional patterns. It's something that I use potentially even more with functional patterns because the people who are looking uh, for help through functional patterns are also just looking, they're more total health oriented than a lot of the people I was seeing in physical therapy. A lot of people who I saw in physical therapy, a lot of them just said, Hey, my doctor sent me here so I can get an MRI and hopefully get a surgery and solve this problem. So I was like, okay, we, I'm not going to be able to make a whole lot of change here. If you don't even believe that we can make a change. Um, but yeah, when, with functional patterns, people are like, I have some gut issues and how do I be healthy and how do I look good and feel good? And I want to be, be able to run and be springy and all this stuff. So just look at full, full holistic approach to health. Um, and I think the biopsychosocial model kind of emphasizes that. We just try to manipulate the, uh, the biologic, whether it's biomechanics, uh, neurophysiology, um, just nutrition, sleep, behaviorals, uh, you know, just the behaviors that drive our physiology. It's mainly how I look at it. But yeah, I talked to some people about coping, stress, um, all sorts of social issues, you know, how people are stressed about money, whatever it is. And I'll sit there and talk with them, help them try to problem solve. So what Naudi did with me on, on day one, the first day I met with Naudi, I was talking to him about my $300,000 student loan debt. So that was, that's fun. And he just sat there and broke down numbers. He's like, oh, that's interesting. So, and he just literally just broke down numbers, broke down behaviors that'll get there. And it's like, hmm, cool. 
you know, thanks, Naudi. So, like, he wasn't here just like, let's do hip flexion chambers. It was, okay, how do I, how do I make James a healthier person? Yeah. So, uh, how about you? Yeah. How about, how about uh, you, Lou? How, do you find yourself using the biopsychosocial model? Do you get, can you guys see it on the screen, by the way? Yeah. yeah. I was just yeah. going to mention everything that you've put up there on that diagram. There, there, there wouldn't be many clients that I haven't covered the majority of those things with. Um, at some point or another, especially considering the people we see in FP are generally chronic pain, have tried multiple other methods, so they get stuck in that chronic pain loop. Um, I think as well as talking to them about these things, the best part of it is we discuss solutions because at the end of the day, if all these issues are feeding into pain or pain is feeding into all these issues, then you're going to get stuck in a little bit of a loop. So the stuff like stress reactivity, that kind of thing, we give solutions to the problem. So doesn't always have to be biomechanical specifically, but we might work on HRV training. We might work on nutrition. We might talk about their financial situation, um, how they can better manage their money within the scope that we can discuss those things. Um, some of the protocols we discuss, like getting out in nature, go and have go and camping for a week and get off your phone, little stuff like that. Um, and even down to the, the concept of the language they use when they're talking about things, um, how to decrease emotional reactions and be more logical with things that are happening in your life. So every single thing on that diagram, we cover a lot. It's just that we place biomechanical um, probably in a bigger circle um, and feeding into the other stuff more than what's been recognized so far in research. Yeah. I think if someone comes in and they, they're presenting themselves in, in a certain posture where you can clearly tell that they're either depressed or they're stressed. Just talking to them about it, it, it from my experience, and you guys can probably uh, agree based on your experience, it's not just going to help. They, they, and, and that's kind of when you say, Lou, that we focus on the, on the biomechanical, we try to get them to operate from a different, uh, yeah, from a different posture for, for lack of a, for, to keep it simple. And then all these other things, the, the behavior, the, the coping, all that stuff makes it a little bit easier just based on many, many degrees, right? They either feel better about themselves, they can move better, now they're in less pain. People compliment them on, on, on how they look. So there's a lot of different aspects of, of that. So uh, yeah, I think, I think we co cover all, if not all of them, um, just the way that we address the the biomechanical aspect the or the, the body language aspect is it's, it's it goes very deep and and you can see that with with the results and just to add to that rodney and what the guys are saying i'm sure you've experienced this as well but there's one or two examples that i've had over the last two years where it was quite amazing i think like the transformation in the psychological and the social as a result of the biomechanical change there was a client coming to me and he was building a house at the time. And in Ireland, anyone in Ireland know that now, these days, builders can be very slow. When times are bad, they're they're available. But when times are good, they're not as available. So he was having some trouble. It was getting delayed all the time. I remember the first time he came in, he was just finishing a phone call with someone, one of the construction workers that was building his house. And he was quite meek. He was quite sort of, you know, overly understanding as I would have seen the situation, but didn't really have the assertiveness to deal with the guy on the phone, maybe, you know? So after about six months, I think he was still building the house and his structure had started to improve quite a lot. And he came in again on the phone one day, about six months later, and basically tore this guy on the phone, a new one, you know? And I just remember looking at him and going, oh my God, like, Jesus, man, like, you know, you're like a different, you're like a different guy, you know? This is like a, it's almost like a, a deja vu moment except the, the outcome is very different like you're much more assertive you're carrying yourself with a lot more confidence he was definitely a lot more assertive in his body language in the way he was speaking in his tone of voice in the way he was making eye contact with me and we didn't really dig into it too much within the time that i was training them like it sort of came as a byproduct you know so like you said and the guy said we take all of those those three elements in and i think a lot of that now is common sense of course you would try and dig as deep into all of the other factors as well as the biomechanical but then some of the medical industry tend to lean too heavily on the other two sides of the circle as a way of justifying not really understanding the biological side there was another girl young girl that was coming to me 
and she had back pain for maybe a year, two years, had been to see some consultants or surgeons and basically got told, oh, like, we, I think it's in your head, you know, I think it's psychological. I think there's nothing wrong with you, basically. And when we had her in and we looked at her structure, there's obviously enough there that I'm like, well, I understand why you're in pain looking at your structure. We improved the structure and lo and behold, things improved and she, she got rid of the pain after that time. But this was a consultant surgeon who maybe didn't want to take on the job of really understanding the biomechanical aspect of why she was in pain. And that model is nice to be able to lean on the other side of it and say, oh, well, this is just pain coming around from the psychological side of it. You know, I've seen that happen quite a lot. Um, and then again, like we're saying, the, the book being passed to the clients and the patients rather than the consultants or the medical practitioners. It's almost like this girl came feeling like she was responsible, you know, or she was at fault somehow for her own pain when really it was just, it wasn't, you know, there wasn't a deep enough dive on why she was in that condition in the first place. Yeah. And this kind of goes uh, or leads us to a, a lot of people that come to us do have pain and we can re to some extent relate it to uh, whether it's the biomechanics and some of the other aspects of the biopsychosocial bottle. But what would you guys say to maybe the people that, that don't experience pain or that don't have pain? What is the benefit uh, with, with what we're doing? And I guess you, you guys probably didn't see too many of, of those cases in, in your practice, but I, I'm starting to get people now. Usually it's parents bringing their kids that will kind of get it. It's like, okay, I want my, I, I see that my kid doesn't move that well. They're either kind of uncoordinated or they struggle with certain things and they're not in pain, but I just want to bring them. I want to help them move better. Um, so yeah. So if, if someone says I, I don't have pain, so I'm good. I don't have to address these things. I can just do the squats or the deadlifts or the other traditional methods, um, which is what FP is, is claiming or, or what we're, we're saying that we, we get with people generally in pain, but not, but not really. Yeah, I have, I have some clients that come, I think I could put them into two camps, those categories when you're talking about that are not in pain. Some that see sense and actually get it, like you said, and know that they're not in pain now, but it doesn't mean they're invincible and that they won't be in pain in the future. Or maybe they want to come for lifestyle improvements or performance improvements if they're playing sports. Or like James said, we deep dive a lot of other stuff like their diet and how their whole body is functioning. But really it's in those two camps. So I get more clients now that come then they're not really in pain, but they know the importance of the biomechanics and in the future, they're looking for longevity. Then you have other clients maybe that will come, I guess, and they, they don't see it as a big of an issue. But the analogy I'll use sometimes with them is if you have a slow puncture in your car or you have a tire that's leaking a little bit of air, like you can drive the car technically like it's fine. You wouldn't maybe even feel it if you've put a little bit of air pressure into it. You can drive it away, but you can only put so many kilometers on that that slow puncture before the tire blows, you know. I think some people just don't have any understanding that the slow puncture is there, even if they're presented with it. Others have the sense to realize that it is there and that they're not invincible, that they need to change the tire as quick as possible, you know. I butt in there as well. I was I was gonna say we're now also getting people calling um, that aren't in pain that are booking in. And they're saying, I've just seen my friend doing functional patterns who might have got out of pain or just had performance improvements and without us prompting anything, they're just like, yeah, they just look like they're moving different. They act like a different person. And I kind of want some of that. Um, so yeah, I think that's an interesting thing that's starting to happen that didn't really happen as much at the start because we were mainly looking at chronic pain. Uh, but now people know that FP is kind of a system that's standing on its own. Um, they start to see, oh, right. So I don't, it's not just a pain relief method either. I'd agree with that Lou as well. Like, I mean, it's a high performance training system that also happens to get people out of pain, but there's so many other aspects to it. So yeah, I'm, I'm seeing the same thing. Yeah, I'd say my, uh, and I haven't objectified it. I haven't done like the L drill or like any of the stuff I did. I, I was on the college football team, division three. I didn't play. I was on the team. I didn't play because I wasn't very friggin' athletic, but I feel, I feel it's subjective. I feel more athletic now than I definitely ever have before in regard to agility and regard to body control. Um, my power with the sprint, definitely feels way um, springier um, teaching myself to throw left-handed. And as I said earlier, I dislocated both my shoulders a bunch of times 
and I got kind of lucky. I stopped dislocating once I had surgery on my right, my left stopped dis dislocating, but no surgery on it. I'm sure that labor room still kind of torn. Um, but being able to now differentiate kind of how my hips rotate, how my femur rotates over my hips, setting me up for um, better stretch potentials through that left arm. I've been able to teach myself to throw with the shoulder that's been dislocated 20 or 30 times, uh, wrestling, football, weightlifting, whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean, just overall, like it feels better to move. I've, can control my movement better. Um, sprint speeds increase. I can control my posture better, you know, and it's just like, I, I could, t I don't even know the right posture sometimes. Right. But I can take up like seven different postures and play with them and move from them. And I think being able to tinker with that is something that will give me far more years of high velocity moving. Um, I never worked in the hospital system, but I've worked in, I did work a little bit in the hospital system, but I've worked more in, uh, skilled nursing, 80 year olds. And it's, you're looking at their postures and yes, their nervous system is decaying. All their physiologic systems are decaying, which is somewhat what we're trying to figure out here, but you can just, uh, uh, to some degree, it's an assumption that they never learned how to actually properly engage their thoracic spine. And I can assume that because now working with 30 and 40 year olds, people don't know how to engage, engage their thoracic spines. So it's like, okay, that's probably a link there. If you don't understand how to engage us now, how are you going to be able to stand up right when you're 70, 80, 90? Um, and just being able to work with that whole spectrum. I, there are assumptions on my part, but I'm assuming that if you can wire your brain in to go, okay, thoracic extension, little, whatever postural uh, variation you're playing with, it's going to set you up for a better future. Yeah, I've had clients coming in as well that, maybe they weren't in pain but anytime they try to work out they get in pain so they they're in this cycle sure. where they're they're in pain they stop working out maybe they do different things maybe just, they just walk or whatever their pain goes away and they try to work out again their pain comes back so a lot of people can say or maybe it's a, it's a popular thing when they say movement is medicine all you have to do is move but what happens when the movement one creates pain or two what happens if you're just moving like you were saying james if you're trying to let's say throw left-handed but you can't segment certain parts of your spine you can't rotate from certain parts of your of, of your spine you can't you know your hip likes to rotate more one way versus the other so now you're moving movement doesn't really become medicine it, it might it might become the opposite and, and i think people are experiencing that when they when they try to work out and then they, they end up being in pain because they're moving from the same places. And I think something that we definitely focus on is getting, getting people to move. Uh, and when we say functionally, or we say more efficiently is creating, creating more segmentation. So then they can, they can actually move from more places, which it seems to decrease the, the likelihood of, of the pain likelihood of the bad posture in the future. It keeps it kind of. It seems like like um, like when you're a kid and you and you bend backwards and like you you could just fold over and then even if you get a little hurt or a little twinge, it's like nothing happened because there's so much. It seems like there's so much water or you know there's so much hydration there. So um, that's how I that's how I see it. I yeah, like the, um, uh, the sorry, you good, James. The the movement is medicine. Um, you know, the, the argument that I continue to make with that is medicine is a very specific, specified field of study. So you don't treat an infection with an opioid. You don't treat, um, you know, certain medications for certain issues. Um, and I think it's the same way with movement. So can we do a, uh, is a clamshell, uh, a standard clamshell versus a basic uh, functional patterns glute act? Um, exercise, are they the same medicine? I would argue that one is more specified to solve uh, a certain problem than another. Um, so yeah, movement is medicine, but medicine is specified. How do we get the most specific medicine that we can to solve these problems? Yeah. And we get, we get a lot of people that come in and say, sorry, we get a lot of physios online and people thinking they see what FB is and they say that we we fear movement with people is a thing that's often thrown up when the alternative is that movement is medicine. Is medicine. I would say that a lot of clients that we get moving, uh, we move them with more complexity 
and difficulty than they would have ever moved before. And these are people that are in chronic pain. So yeah, the whole movement is medicine thing. We're, we're getting them to move with better quality. Um, I think the overall thing with functional patterns is that we're probably, not probably, like we are the best mitigators of risk in the industry. The, we, we're able to look at an exercise or look at a movement and figure out the negative externalities of that movement or a task. And then we figure out what's the best way to progress this person as we would, as any other person would in a personal training program or physio, how do we overload this person with a specific stimuli, but mitigate the risk as best as possible while doing it? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry, right now. I was just going to say I would support that as well. Like, I mean, the big difference, like James is saying, the movement versus medicine, like, in medicine and pharmacology and pharmaceuticals, there's a sort of respect for precision around prescription. So if you give someone 10 times, you know, the heart medication, like it could kill them. Like we have a respect for that, but we have absolutely no respect for that in terms of training physically, which I don't understand. It's, it's a very far, it seems very far behind, but in reality, the reason why is because the practitioners implementing that precision have to actually be able to do it on themselves. So like, it's more difficult. There's no, there's no way around it, you know? You're trying to educate a client to be able to execute things precisely and then actually be able to, you know, have that precision at home by themselves. So it's not a passive thing, you know, it's not like you're doing something manipulating them. You're trying to bring them along for the ride. You're trying to educate them. So there's definitely a precision involved. And like Lou was saying, like if you get the right precision, you can, you can literally take away someone's pain almost immediately. That's something I've noticed with traditional therapy is like, oh, you do these strength exercises. And once you've made the adaptation, after a few weeks, you know, then things will start to improve. But I've had people doing chamber sequences. And if you were just one variable, it's literally like, oh, I'm in pain and now I'm not in pain. Like it's, it's almost immediate, you know, like the response is so quick when the precision is there, you know, that's really the, the difference I feel with function patterns. It's just the, the pure level of precision that we're, we're dealing in is, is like on another level. And unless you've experienced it, you don't know about it. You can't know unless you've experienced that. Yeah. And that's, what's hard about it. If, the people that are going to be listening there, maybe they haven't experienced it. So let's go a little deeper into why, what we mean by precision. So uh, James, you were talking about the clamshell. So what are some of the, maybe the negative externalities that you see with an exercise, like the clamshell um, go into that and then maybe go into just a few principles that we use in when we do, let's say a hip flexion chamber, like what, what kind of um, factors were, were, accounting for and how that relates yeah, I mean, to someone walking to someone moving across space. Yeah. Um, to put it simply, the clamshell, it's, it could potentially be done in a way that facilitates enough tissue tension for it to be appropriate. I've never played with it. Um, but the force vectors, at least for walking, it doesn't really hit too much of the force vector for walking. Um, and just an, an anecdote, I've had a lady come in with a, a uh, bad back, bad knee. Um, she couldn't afford my services. So she went to a different physical therapist. They gave her clamshells um, and it just lit up both of them. Even though after the first day of me taking her through hip flexion correctives, as now has taught them, um, it's just like, oh yeah, my butt, my quad, my everything. I feel all this pumped. I feel good. My pain is pretty minimal. Like she felt pretty good. Went and did a set of clamshells and it jacked her up. And I was like, that's interesting. That's not what I would have expected to that degree, but um, her system was, I'm going to say unstable in quotes enough, uh, unstable enough that uh, the specificity, specificity of the movement made a big difference on her outcome. Um, so You bring up, uh, you know, the the number of variables that we cover, and that's something that I, I think should be touched on to some degree, is the number of variables that we cover in functional patterns, I think, is part of why we get such high results, where you see this beautiful side bend rotation through the spine, you see this perfectly stable pelvis, you see these nicely timed rotations of the humerus of the femur, um, and that's because of the sheer amount of um, variables that we're trying to get to work together. But even, and this is just a call for uh, my, my fellow physical therapists in America, I'm not sure how many there are that have any functional patterns credentialing. I'm pretty sure I'm the only HBS3. Um, and for the longest time, I was the only uh, physical therapist 
who was an HBS. Um, but if you're to take even some of the watered down versions of the correctives that Naudi teaches, because they are at a horizontal force, because there's reciprocal forces, we don't have to even hit this 10, 12, 13 different variables. Even if we just hit one variable and hit it somewhat okay, it's going to have more of a better effect with less risk than a lot of the other glute exercises that we could um, try to create using traditional methods. So that's kind of my, my uh, call to the other physical therapists out there is like, learn some of this stuff. Even if it's a watered down, you start to play with it a little bit with some of your clients, you're going to start to figure out how to reset your protocols, um, how to think about glute training, how to think about core training, um, and more or less just help your clients get uh, fitter, healthier, and uh, provide a bigger benefit. Yeah, was, um, just with that anecdote you even used then with the lady, um, she did clamshells and then a hip flexion chamber. Now, to an outside observer watching those two exercises, the higher risk one would seem to be the standing up one, um, but the lying down one that traditionally would be given for those for those lower back pain, hip issues, was the one that actually flared them up. So once again, going back to that risk mitigation point, we're controlling the variables better. Even when it's only one variable, it's much tighter. It's There's much less room for error effectively. Even in an exercise like a clamshell, which you think couldn't go too wrong, we're, we're not developing enough interoception with a client, I would say. Like when we're doing these corrective exercises in chambers, we're able to isolate even one variable better than any other system. It's just the thing is we then can progress from there and use these other exercises as a way to progress them through these stages. And then it can translate to movements like walking, running, throwing, standing, these kind of things. Yeah. The way I see it too. Sorry, Tom. The way I see it with the, with the clamshell and then hip flexion exercise. I, when I used to be in a lot of back pain, laying down was fine. The moment I had to get up and walk, that's when, everything would, would lock up and it would hurt. So it's not just that we're accounting for variables either, is that we're using, like when you see someone move, there's physics involved. And from you laying down on the floor to you standing up and having to move across space, there's a lot of different uh, things that happen. And, and, and in application, they, they change a lot. So that's, that's all I want to say with that. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, like you were saying there, Rodney, like the relationship to gravity is so different in both situations, you know. Um, I've also got clients that will come in and I'm trying to educate them as time goes on on how to make better exercise choices, we'll say, in the beginning when they're maybe not fully sort of able to just drop everything they've ever done and go full FP because in the beginning you have to strip it back quite a lot. I'm trying to teach them to make better choices, but the clam is a good example. The way I look at it or explain to them is like a lot of these exercises are sold on the headlines, but they're not digged into the fine print. So the headline is, you're gonna strengthen your glute. Happy days. The fine print is, are you doing that clamshell in an overly posteriorly tilted pelvic position? Are you now gonna associate the glute tension with that posterior pelvic position? Have you got any rotation involved in the glute activation? So when you start digging into it, you realize that the risk to reward of a lot of these exercises, the headlines sells it, but really the fine print then makes you realize that they're gonna give me five other problems down the line. So even if they can patch something up now, they're going to give me five problems down the line. Um, and then just like to go back to what James said about stripping even back the amount of variables. So for anyone that's that's watching this, that's on the fence or a potential client or potential, like like James is calling the physical therapist in America, likewise to the physiotherapist in Ireland, if people are on the fence and they're maybe put off by the fact that it seems very complex. When we all started, really our, our ability to deal with these variables wasn't as good as it is now as we continue our training with function patterns. But even the most simple variable or one variable doing really well, like the two guys said, can be so much more powerful than these sort of other exercises that are traditionally used because there's no sort of fine print. There's no negative fine print. As you increase your skill, if you're a client or your practitioner, you just get an ability to add more variables in. And I have clients that have come for a while and then they acknowledge that they're like, wow, you know, in the beginning, remember when we were doing a plank or a quad pad and I couldn't even separate my pelvis and my ribs and, and I just wanted the other. And now they're doing chambers where it's like, wow, we're adding more variables all the time. And they're surprised themselves. So like, wow, I can't believe I'm, I'm actually managing all these things at once. And the more precise I get, 
then the more intense the activations get. And I'm realizing now that that precision comes along with much more powerful, you know, outcome in the end. And once you get on that, that road, I think you get hooked a little bit, you know, I think that's probably all of us like, and the clients as well, you can see it happening with them. Yep. So whether the pain or the, the amount of variables that someone can, can coordinate, you know, Tom, you were saying that one of your clients, they did, a, they did a glute chamber and I have that experience as well. They'll, they'll activate their glutes and then suddenly their pain has diminished. Sometimes it takes a lot longer, one month, two months. So For sure, yeah. There, so there's this, um, it, the, the natural, supposedly natural progression of, of pain that has been brought up as well, where it is said that FP, um, somehow we, we attract clients right as their pain is about to just naturally disappear so can you guys uh kind of speak a little bit about that uh is the pain just getting getting uh better by itself i had a client she was on medication eight months of pain physical therapist chiropractor about to just um do surgery and then about two weeks in three weeks in her pain diminished significantly so was that and I've had many other instances that, that I could, that I could uh, share, but uh, it doesn't seem to me and it doesn't seem to her that the pain was just going to go away by itself. Should she, had, uh, should she have waited another four months or another month to see, like, how can we even test that? Um, so yeah, if you guys want to go into it a little bit, Tom. It'd be very coincidental as all I'd say, you know, like I said, it's, it's funny. You have people on these time scales. Someone could be three months in pain. Someone could be 10 years in pain, but they each happen to reach that point, even though it's totally different timelines and time scales. Like that would be astonishing. If you ask me, like that'd be pretty unbelievable. You know what I mean? Especially when they've tried so many other things. Like you said, a lot of people come in and go, I've tried X, Y, and Z. The other thing is as we look at the mechanics and it always sort of correlates with improvements in the structure and mechanics. So that's the other thing that, that leads us to believe it's not the case, that it's like, it would be different. You could make the argument if they come in and there was no improvement in their understanding of, like James said, how to position themselves properly, or if there's no visible improvements in the mechanics or stability in their hips, if they were literally the exact same they walked in after six months, maybe you could, you could say that, but even then it would be a reach. But there's, there's definitely, it's, there's always a correlation with the mechanics and the structure in my, in my experience anyway. Yeah, so we're seeing the we're seeing the changes, and either someone that doesn't doesn't have a trained eye or may want to disagree, they might be able to say that uh, either the biomechanics you, know, you can't change biomechanics, or that the changes aren't happening. And we're going to go into a, a study, uh, kind of show showcase that. Uh, but let's first go into the the study where it says that forty six percent of uh, physical therapies don't follow the the best guidelines so i'm going to go ahead and share it here with you guys i believe it's give me one second sorry about that i'm just going to share this can you guys see that yes or no yeah. okay i share the wrong one so give me a second Hey guys, I've got a, my two fifteens rolling in here. I've got to run out of here. Um, got started a little bit later than I was expecting. Um, something I do want to touch on though, and I don't think it was fully answered. Rodney, you had brought up that um, people say that, and Tom touched on it a little bit, that functional patterns and the practitioners try to get people to fear pain. Um, and I, I think that's absolutely wrong. And I just want to touch on a little bit more of what Tom said. Um, yeah, we tried we try to teach people the mechanical um, the mechanical outcomes of different movements. So like a back squat creates a certain compression. And if you're, uh, your spine will shift one way or another because it's being compressed. So whether it's more of a lateral shift um, or scoliosis is just going to get accentuated. Um, so um, I don't think anybody in functional patterns is trying to push people into fear of movement. We're trying to teach people better movements, better choices. How do we get a bigger bang for our buck with our movements? Um, and I just really wanted to, to settle that one um, the best that I can, because it's something that I hear a lot. I see a lot. Um, you know, we don't think the back squat and the deadlift is a, the best movements for your body. 
Um, am I personally afraid of a back squat or a deadlift? No. Like, and I lift heavy crap all the time. I move my treadmill, hundred pound, uh, you know, Atlas stone lifts, whatever. It's all good. But like, if I had somebody who is dealing with kind of constant low back pain, having them understand a horizontal force vector versus a, an axial force vector, compressive weight on their back, um, there's a there's a clear uh, difference between the two. But I have got to run. Thanks, it's James. been a pleasure, boys. Um, I'd love to do more of these. Whatever. Hit me up. All right, All right brother. Thank you. Peace, mate. Yeah, going off on what James was saying, we it's not like we pick exercises like the back squat or the deadlift and we choose not to like them. We try to do our, our best, the best that we can and assess the implications of it from a physics standpoint and from uh, the movement standpoint. So we're relating the physics to the organism. And from that, it's like you, you don't want to have a dog walk on two legs for an extended period of time. And you don't want to load that position either. You're probably going to mess up some something in the in the way that that dog moves. So, um, yeah, that's how that's how I see it. It's uh, and like and like uh, James said, we're we're picking and we're lifting stuff up. We're just not doing it in that way. So, great. Uh, so yeah, let me share the the study here, and then we'll go into that one. Can you see that? Yes, Sadre. Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, you want to get into it, Lou? Uh, feel free to have me scroll down as we just kind of show. Yeah, that's, the, that's cool. This this study is fairly self-explanatory. I think the, the big thing point we want to make with something like this and what we've noticed as well is that if these or this supposed best practice is being put in place, then surely you'll be getting like unbelievable or at least very good outcomes with it. So then the majority of physios should be following that. So you've got a case here of one of probably two things, either the research isn't really applicable um, or replicable on real clients um, or the physios are terrible. Like it's, it's one of the two of them. And I think there's a lot of physios that like genuinely want to do good work and they try and do good work, but it seems like the research and the best practice isn't really being followed by half of the physios. So it's, it's that one or the other kind of thing we're looking at here. 46% um, of them don't follow what they say is best practice. Like, yeah, I, it can't be more obvious than that with a study like that. It's half of, half of them. Yeah, something I want to point out here. Um, so some of the treatments that are, are also being, being used um, – kind of to your point, Lou, it's like, why, why aren't they using those if, if they're available and they're the best? Um, I looked over, I don't have it on me, but I looked over the, the NICE guidelines and a lot of their, the, the articles that they have there, they're very low quality and they, they're, it's self-reported that the, the, they're not that reliable. Uh, so that's one, one point to, to make. Another, one more point that I wanted to make on this one was some of the the weaknesses in even in the in the study and, and why it's physical therapists using this but two the the ones that are or how they um what they're showing here it's not that reliable either because um the way that it was uh reported so it says here the main weakness of this review is that primary studies only reported treatment choices for individual treatments and not combinations of treatments as a result, we did not determine the percentage of physical therapists that provided only recommended, only not recommended treatments, and only treatments with no recommendation or other combinations of treatments. So, um, yeah, the study's there, and um, I, I don't know exactly what it's supposed to. Um, I guess it's supposed to, to say that um, the reason why people aren't getting uh, results with physical therapies is because they're not using the um, the treatments, but, but it's, yeah, but it's really, it's, it's really hard to say. Like you um, said, Lou, it's one of the two, you know, but from your experience as a physio and mine, I probably neglected a lot of the research based practices, not because I was a negligent physio that didn't know what he was doing because I actually had tried and realized that it wasn't doing the business like that. I would have put myself among the 46%, but there was a reason like I tried it and it, it didn't work on myself, even, you know? So that was, I think that's, that's what I take from that study more so 
than the other side of that, like you're saying. I think that's quite obvious if you want to look yeah. at it that way. If you want to look yeah, at exactly. it the other way, you can choose to believe it the other way as well. But Yes, we look, we look for the best available evidence, which is what you should do. And then once that's been ruled in or out with a client or with a group of clients that we've seen that come in with the same thing, then we tend to go towards our experience. And the thing is with functional patterns, we now have hundreds, maybe even thousands of cracks with experience with particular conditions. So it's all well and good saying use the research first, but when you've tried it on a hundred people and back in the day, thousands of people, when I was doing work in musculoskeletal settings, hospitals, aged care, that kind of thing, when you've tried these things over and over, what's, what's the definition of insanity? It's like, eventually we're going to try what works with experience. We're still mitigating risk. We're still taking all the necessary measures to make sure these people are in the minimum risk of exaggerating or exacerbating their symptoms. But, we end up having to go with this experience because as you see on the Instagram, as you see all over the web, like functional patterns results are coming through in droves and they're getting better and better and better. So the experience we're following and the experience that we find that thousands of other people are having is more influential, it seems, um, and just gets better results than just following these articles, which I think we're about to go into another one. Where, yeah, I put it up. Yeah, cool. That's not really showcasing a real knowledge of biomechanics. Um, so while Roddy's putting that one up, this one looked at um, the relationship between potentially changing biomechanics and pain in osteoarthritis clients. Um, you can see people. that, by the way? Scrolling down, yeah, that's you can see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, and effectively, they took people through a gait assessment test um, and then two groups of exercises. Um, Rodney, do you want to go through that stuff yeah so they were comparing the effects of neuromuscular exercises as they uh the abbreviation is nexa versus a quadricep strengthening protocol which they're probably going to be more so the the neuromuscular they're more standing load bearing almost like what we were mentioning earlier with how we address things in in functional patterns um and then the quadriceps is more i would say more maybe more traditional just laying down not really it seems like they're almost trying to say, okay, the, the neuromuscular is going to change the, the biomechanics versus the quadriceps strengthening is just, you're just strengthening the muscles in an isolated fashion. So that's what they did. Something that I want to uh, point out here was the, the physical therapist, so the patients and the, the, the interventions here. So, um, so the, the physiotherapists that were uh, delivering the interventions were, highly they're highly regarded it seems like so they have 12 years of uh an average of 12 years of experience but from two to 30 years uh with clinical experience and then three of them or 30 percent sorry it was three of them three out of nine they had master level degree association so they were highly qualified and they were performing um these these two types of, of treatment um so then and i guess it was a 12 week 12 week time so Let's go into this a little bit. So here's the summary of the exercises. I don't know if you want to go into it as well, Lou, but this is basically the, it says a forward and backward sliding or stepping. And then we'll go into the picture in a bit. There's a sideways exercise, and then they have some functional uh, hip muscle strengthening, which is an isometric um, motion, and then some, some wall squats, it's what it seems like and then some steps and then a balance. So that's the near muscular exercise. So uh, what do you see here, Lou, in terms of the- Yeah, it's, it's just terribly gen generic, I suppose, is probably the overall summary of them. Um, anyone, I mentioned this in the video I did a couple of weeks back on my biomechanics matter, matter but if this is the extent to which you think you can change the mechanics, uh, then, and if and if everything's judged from these exercises, then we can really see why they think biomechanics don't matter. Um, as James was talking about before, and Tom, even in the most basic glute chamber, we are going to offer a much more direct stimuli because um, they were looking at knee adduction um, moments um, and seeing if that changed in the walking test afterwards. And just looking through the, through those exercises, there's nothing there that I would say would change that in any period of time, let alone over a 12 week period. Um, these things are hard to change. It's, these things have been forming generally on these chronic pain clients for a long period of time. It's bone deep. 
So to change that isn't going to be some squats and step ups for 12 weeks and then seeing if it changes. And an important thing to notice here is they're not saying that like at the end of here, they say the pain changed in both groups, but the biomechanics didn't change. Um, so of course there's situations where just getting someone to load more or strengthen more is going to help their pain. Um, we're talking about these chronic pain clients who are repeatedly coming in over a, after five, 10 years of trying multiple different professionals in the in that manner. Yeah. Something else that I wanted to point to is, uh, you know, these, these therapists, um, seem to have experience that they've seemed to, I guess, provided some of these interventions before. So, so they're not, um, just researchers that are researchers that, that are a poppy that could be maybe an, an argument. Um, something up to point out here is that the, with the Nexa, so with the neuromuscular exercises, they, they had a lot of dropouts. So people that could not complete the, um, the study and, um, let me see if I can find that. And they're, they're relating that to the exercise being standing versus, uh, lying. And it says that it, they could affect the, the joint, uh, the knee joint load. Um, so they ended up having, let me see if I can find it, but they, a, a good amount of people, um, having to withdraw and those people were not included in the results. So when they say, um, the changes in biomechanics didn't change, but the pain changed, they're not including these people that had to, uh, had to withdraw from the, from the study. So yeah. And if they're saying that, does that sound those, like survivorship are... bias to you? It's kind yeah. of what it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. And those standing exercises generally are the ones where they pull the out more from. So that would indicate yep. the biomechanics potentially does have a effect. Okay. Even just to, to go yeah. over that, that, that list of exercises, you know, like the, the right intervention here. group that they had, something that's really clear when you're looking at that compared to what we're doing when we first assess someone is like there's no mention or understanding or maybe even focus on say like someone's spinal position say for example you know like a lot of what we do when someone comes in first we assess that as a sort of a, a big sort of fish to fry like do you know what i mean this one the biggest fish to fry so you can see on the fp results on the instagram and stuff there's people with vertebral protrusions literally shifting them forwards and actually building erector muscles around it like you can see their spine integrity increase so i feel that's such a big component of how well biomechanically someone's going to react to any exercise that if their pelvis, their rib cage, their C-spine, if all these things are in correct sort of sequence and alignment, it's going to allow a lot more tension to, to run through the whole body as a whole. You know what I mean? Like you have seen that in yourself when you're training people, you can adjust someone's spine properly. Then all of a sudden things start lighting up like a Christmas tree now. So I feel like it's just, it's, it's almost laughable looking at some of those exercises because there's so much that's not accounted for. You can have one person and that step. Horrible. And it shows, and it shows right here, more patients in the Nexa group, the exercise that we just showed above, they withdrew due to increased pain or an unanticipated decision to undergo total joint replacement. And that was seven compared to the other group when they were lying down, which only one person had to, to withdraw. So it, it really shows that not only doing something like this is going to probably be Exactly, or, or make it and then the people that it didn't that they, they were able to kind of push through it um and and the, you know their pain didn't i guess was comparatively to the or the, their pain didn't change or or got better um their mechanics you know their mechanics they're using those people as the mechanics didn't change whereas if i think if they would have um kept the people that were in pain i'm sure their mechanics were probably changed for the worse but you even look and, at that picture on the right, guys, as well. Like the picture, the two pictures there, like the one on the right, I'm even finding it hard to look at that, you know. It's like you can tell what's going on when that is not a freeze-framed image. As that woman's bringing her leg out and back in, her, her hips are shifting to the right and her knee is, is, is going to be falling in. And they actually have the band set up in such a way that they're almost promoting the valgus. And you can see, I guess, that her head, her center of gravity is off. Like it's not where it should be. Like it should be further off. Yeah, why are they promoting the... <laughs> Like this is, but that's wild. Like, you know, if you look at her center of gravity on her head, it's slap bang. She's on one leg essentially. So she's putting weight through one leg 
put her head and her whole center mass is like going the wrong direction almost. Yeah. Like I guarantee yeah, it her, doesn't... if her head was, was more to the other side, it would promote her hips to go left and her knee to go right. But like, yeah, even I mean, that, we talk about the said principle a lot. We talk about the said principle a lot. And like, if you're going to employ an intervention, it needs to match what you're trying to actually improve. So their, their testing for this was a 10 meter walk. I think Rodney was saying before. Correct. So, and then like, look at that position, even of that exercise, is that a position you're going to find when we're doing a 10 meter walk? And, and let's think of that as well. It's, it's a 10 meter walk and they're looking at pain management. Let's take these guys on a, a 60 meter sprint. Let's make these guys do a ver repeated vertical jumps. It's, it's a very low bar to set to look at a 10 meter walk and generic exercises as a way to rule out the fact that biomechanics don't matter, basically. Yeah. yeah. When, uh, with the criticism that the research uses, uh, they're more objective because they use a, the three dimensional gain analysis and, and there's all these cameras and sensors and force plates. Um, they're really only measuring, again, that 10 meter walk. Um, so it, it's, it's very suspect, for lack of a better word. Yeah, and like you've probably seen this guys yourself, but there's some really, I guess, well-known clinics around, you know, that use a lot of this really expensive equipment, like the 3D analysis, biomechanical stuff. And it doesn't just say that the, the equipment doesn't measure certain variables, but it's just the interpretation of the information is what's, is what's lacking, you know? It's like you were overly focused maybe on force plates and like we sort of can look at someone walking and know by the way we're looking at them that they're going to be putting more force through one side of their body than the other or when they strike with one foot, they're shifting their whole body across to that side as a compensation because maybe their rib cage can't rotate and lean that way. So like those are things that you don't really need a force plate to to see that, but like you can see it, you know, pretty clearly, I guess. And I feel like I've seen people coming in from clinics with there's one there's one thing opened up here, and I'm sure there's probably similar things over there. And they have a computer generated sort of, you know, like they put markers on you and they do really in depth and they really sell it as like there's no guesswork here, you know. And I've seen them even having digs at FP indirectly saying, oh, we don't need anything up to guesswork here. We don't use our eyes. We use like expensive machinery to know you know exactly what someone's issue are and we've had multiple clients come from this place and actually the exercises are are like generic like this like just just stretching they're doing crazy stuff like so they're identifying when you look at the report of what the machine has pulled out you would have to agree with a lot of it when you actually assess their gait but then the intervention that they've made in order to change it is never going to change it like just there's, there's, there's just no way so it's it's one thing is is the assessment and the detail they have there, but it's the interpretation and then the application of the intervention to actually change it. Is yeah. and FP of like eight years away. And yeah. yeah, FP have played around with motion capture. I know even six seven years ago, I saw Naudi doing a lot of motion capture stuff. But um, what's the saying we have is for all the gear, no idea. It's like you can have all this fancy equipment, but how exactly what Tom said, how you interpret that data um, and what you're actually doing to improve it is the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, our main criticism is the the interventions really that they're it's, it, they can't. Yeah. It, it, it's hard to to justify the conclusions with the interventions that they're that they're providing. So yeah. Um, yeah. And then with that as well, a, a lot of the things that we talked about, we're getting people in um, in chronic pain that have gone through all the rigors. They've already been failed by the physical therapists, the chiropractors, acupuncturists, massage therapists, even some other alternative uh, methods. So they're usually very, very skeptical once, once they come to us. And then the last thing is that they pay out of, out of pocket. So uh, they're paying a lot of money. They're somewhat distrusting in the beginning. Um, and they're, they're in a lot of pain where a lot of the things that they are already, they have had to stop a lot of the things that they, generally want to do because uh, they're in pain so we're not really telling them to to stop doing too much because a lot of the time they can't and uh and yeah we're usually able to at least my experience is my experience right now the past year most people that come and stick with it they they stick around and they get results or sorry they want, the ones that they stick with it they get results and they they want to stick around even after they're out of pain so once they're out of pain they they want to keep 
keep coming because the changes that we're doing are the bi biomechanical changes are not are not just um, they're not superficial. You know, they 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 impact them like what Tom was saying in their demeanor, how they uh, behave with their family or with their job or just in general. So I don't know if you guys have anything else to to add. Yeah, just saying like the skepticism, it's healthy. Like it makes sense. The The bar as we set of the industry is very is set very low. So we understand people are coming in skeptical. They're in chronic pain. They want a solution that they haven't been able to find yet. So we want to change that. We want to make these results even more ridiculous than they already are getting. Um, I can't even imagine what five years time will look like with the progression of the results from people all around the world, let alone from... Um, the innovation that Naudi and the crew are kind of putting forward. So, yeah, come in sceptical, but at the same time um, have that also open mind to going maybe the way that the research is being done is potentially the reason that I'm still having these issues. Yeah. Anything to add, Tom? No, I guess, I guess just to any future clients or people looking, like you were saying, we've sort of addressed this to some people that might be on the fence or some therapists that might be on the fence. There's no question that like functional patterns as a system requires work on the end of the client and of the practitioner, but the reward is so huge. Like when you can get over that, I think that's the only thing that would stop someone having success with functional patterns is maybe that they're not willing to try and take on a little bit of work. And that's why we're here is to help guide people. Like it's not a, an unsurmountable task. Like it's not a huge mountain to climb really. And as time goes on, like Lou said, Naudi has been codifying this so well and teaching and passing it on to us that it's getting easier all the time. Like it's getting easier than it was a few years ago. I feel like it's, as a trainer, I feel like we're getting more efficient than it. it's getting easier. So it's not to turn people off and think that it's super difficult and super complex, but there's definitely, they have to be willing to do some work. And I think that's the, the reason why some people won't get there. Like you said, Rodney, if someone sticks it out and stays the course, the success rate is almost like 100%, you know? Um, but even people that have come to me like that and they're not ready yet, and they maybe do a little bit of a circuit of another few, you know, traditional therapists, but they do end up coming back. And then they're sort of like, okay, no, I'm, I'm, I see it now, I'm ready to do it, you know? But the reward is huge. I mean, it's your body, it's longevity. We've got one life. And to be able to have the body working as well as it can and get you to the finish line in a decent state, like experiencing reality through a body that's functioning versus not, it's a different life. It's, you couldn't even call it the same thing. It's just like, it's a different version of reality. So I would just encourage anyone that's on the fence to try and get involved because it's really worthwhile. It's helped a lot of us. It's helped myself personally a lot. So yeah, that, that's, that would be the last thing I could say, I guess, on that. I was yeah. going to interject with one more thing. Sorry, Rodney. Um, Sorry. One thing a lot of physios and other professionals say is, can I mix this stuff? And don't get us wrong. Like when you dive all in with FP, the results seem to be a lot better. I'm not just saying that. Like with all my clients, when they follow all of our protocols, it seems to be a better result overall. But at the same time, like you're new to it, we get it, you're skeptical. So physios specifically, I'm addressing here, just try and implement some of the more basic techniques. Like even looking at planks, looking at lunges, we have our own kind of modifications of those easier exercises. Just try with a client. We, As we said, mitigate the risk, make sure this client can safely perform it, and then just try out adding some FP exercises in. Um, we think it works better when you go all in, but I still think there's a capacity for you to start. Everyone's got to start somewhere. Um, even the 10 week online course now has a professional version where you can claim CECs for that. Um, I believe it's in America and England. Don't quote me on England, but you'll be able to use this for your continuing education. So start to implement some of this stuff. And if you're not confident doing it on clients, just try it on yourself. That kind of, that's where we all came from, um, coming from a history of physio and yourself, Rodney, as well in exercise science. Yeah. Um, so try this stuff on yourself first and just test and retest. I mean, that's the way that science has been done forever is just test a hypothesis and then retest it and see if it's helped or not. So yeah, try this stuff out. Um, look at the 10-week course, look at the functional training system and there are ways that you can potentially start to change your frame of thinking with regards to how you train your clients. Yeah, functional patterns is not just the, the dancing around that people call it. Um, yeah, like like you were saying, Lou, do the ten week course, uh, try the FTS, and 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 really give it a, 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 a try to work on the execution because that's that's where you're gonna get the the benefit. And I I actually when I went to school I was doing like a 
pre-med or they call it pre-med, but you can go into physical therapy as well. And I ended up not going that route, but uh, I didn't even want to be a personal trainer when I went to school. I was just, I just picked something to, to study. So I don't know if you probably, you guys probably wouldn't recommend people to go into uh, phys- physical therapy, huh? For the debt and for the result. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend people yeah. to go to, go to college for <laughs> exercise science. No, like, yeah, likewise. I've had people come to me asking me, you know, like younger guys that are thinking of trying to get into it and I've given them alternative routes, like true functional patterns or ways they can legally be insured to do this. And I'm saying to them, yeah, it's a no brainer. If I had, if I had the opportunity at the time, I, w- I would have done it. You know, Luckily I was ignorant and oblivious at the time. Otherwise I would have never survived the four years because I actually believed while I was doing it that it was, it was correct. But if I had to go through it again, no one would have known how. Yeah, I wouldn't be uh, the top of the the teacher's pets list. That's for sure. We probably would be causing a lot of drama in there, trying to argue with lecturers and professors and things, you know. Yeah, and then you save yourself a lot of debt. FP turns out to be a lot more economical and and way more valuable than than the physical therapy degree and, in my case, the exercise science degree. So, cool, guys. Well, yeah, I appreciate you guys coming on, and uh, I think we got through most of it, so... We'll see if uh, we need to do a follow up, but I think we cover cover a lot. Any, if you guys don't have anything else, we'll we'll end it there. Yeah, That's thanks good. for having me. Thank you for that, guys. Yeah, really appreciate it. Okay, guys, have a good one.